Welcome back, Pet Parent. I'm so excited for today's interview because I have a veterinarian, but she's so much more than a veterinarian, <laughs> uh, coming to talk to you today about what, what I think is one of, but for her is pro possibly the most important crises in veterinary medicine today. Dr. Josie Bug is a licensed veterinarian, but she has also trained and teaches and has over 20 years of practical experience in traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. When she began studying TCVM at Qi University, she also began practicing the internal alchemy of Taoism and Tibetan Buddhism to integrate the often forgotten spiritual branch of these ancient healing arts. She has used holistic healthcare as her primary mode of healthcare personally, studying herbalism in college and wild crafting her own medicines for personal use over the past 30 years. She has experienced, learned, and practiced numerous energy medicine modalities, integrating them into her practice, Reiki, Tea Touch, Body Talk, Taoist Stone Medicine, and more. Dr. Josie earned her bachelor's degree in biology, neurobiology, biology, and cognitive ethology. She worked in the trenches of the animal welfare field for eight years. When she discovered veterinarians were using needles and herbs to heal animals, she decided to obtain her degree in veterinary medicine with the intention of practicing holistic veterinary medicine. So Dr. Josie has something so incredibly important to talk to us today. And I do believe that it is one of the huge crises in veterinary medicine today. And I'm going to let her explain it all to you. Make sure to stick around until the end because there isn't a moment of her interview that you want to miss. Whether you have a pet and have experienced this with your veterinarians, maybe you're currently experiencing this with your veterinarian, or you just want to prepare for the future, this is is possibly, I know that it's only January, but maybe one of the most important podcasts you can listen to all year. So stick in there, listen to, to every word Dr. Josie has to say. I have to tell you, this hour flew by for me, and I think it will for you too. Make sure to stick around till the end so that you can figure, find out how to also follow Dr. Josie on social. With that, Let's get into today's interview. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So, Dr. Josie, thank you so much for being here. I know you have an incredibly important topic that you want to talk about today. And it's one of, I think there are multiple crises in veterinary medicine right now, but it's one of the, one of the big ones. But before I like unleash you on the topic, can you introduce yourself a little bit to the listener and let them know like your journey, how you got to where you are and working with animals? Well, I, um, Oh, goodness. It's been a whole lifelong journey. I will say I went to um, my oldest. I'm, a, I'm from a family of five kids and I'm the very youngest. My oldest brother was 19 years older than me and he went to veterinary school. So when I was like three or four years old, he was like my hero. And my family was always associated with animals. I come from like a, a cattle ranching family out in South Dakota, actually. <laughs> it's like Yellowstone, the show Yellowstone. Like, yeah, that's where my roots are. So when I... I knew I wanted to go into medicine. And then my father was like, well, girls, girls, you know, they, 
veterinary medicine can't be for girls. They can't go out there and handle cows and horses and everything. And I learned, I heard that when I was very little. So I shoved it aside. So long story short, I went through, um, high school and everything. And I became really interested. My mom was in a really bad car wreck when we, when I was 14, I was with her and my dad. And I saw the failures of Western medicine with her going through that. She had to have, um, now they're doing the fusion on the neck all the time, but she, at the time she couldn't even find a doctor to do it. And the insurance doctors were saying, oh, you're going to be paralyzed. But so I saw the failures of, of Western medicine then. And so I started after that car accident, my sister got us all going to a naturopath. And this was back in the early 80s. Um, so I started chiropractic care on myself when I was like 12 years old. We were doing colonics. He was reading irises. Um, so I grew up with that. And then when I got into college, I discovered Susan Weed and Western herbs. And I started digging my own roots <laughs> and making my own herbal tinctures. It's actually a lot of them out on my grandfather's ranch in the Black Hills in South Dakota. So I was making, I mean, one of my first herbal allies was burdock because burdock grows wild out there. The best echinacea grows out there, um, all of that. So I was making my own medicine. And then I knew I loved animals. And so when I, gr I graduated with a degree in biology and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was waiting for my boyfriend to get out of school and I got a job at the local humane society. Well, that ended up being an eight year long voyage through nonprofit humane society, um, animal shelter work. And i and, and also working for some veterinarians. And I found along the way, I ended up finding Richard Pitcairn's book, and I saw that vets were using the kind of medicine I was using on myself my, for most of my life on animals. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And so I had to go to veterinary school in order to do that. Because I called up uh, American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. I'm like, how do I get to do this? Well, they're like, you have to be a DVM. So I ended up having just the right amount of classes. I'd been out of college for five years. So I went back to veterinary school wanting to practice herbal medicine, wanting to practice acupuncture, wanting to do all this stuff. And it was... Um, you know, I knew it was going to be tough because going through four years of hardcore Western medical training. So I knew I had to have some things, keys in my pocket to help get me through. And one of those was Reiki. This is back in like 1990. And so I went actually. Yeah, I got my Reiki certification back then. So I figured I can do long distance energy healing while I'm standing there in medical rounds being grilled by clinicians. <laughs> and that's, I did, I used that a lot getting through veterinary school. So um, getting out, when, and when I was in veterinary school, I was also president of the Holistic Veterinary Medical Association student chapter. So I brought in a lot of the founders from OFMA and people like Alan Schoen and Cheryl Schwartz and Will Winter and all these big names. I would go to the conference and say, come to the University of Wisconsin and teach us about homeopathy or something. So I'd get up in front of all these farm boys and be like, yeah, we were having a class at lunch on, you know, chiropractic care for dairy cows. <laughs> they kind of look at me like cross-eyed. But I also, I, I gained, garnered a lot of respect because I also worked down in the hospital and I knew I had to have the respect of the clinicians if I was going to make it through. So, and I actually ended up the, the vet school on graduation, they hired me as a clinician for six months to fill in in the hospitals, which was kind of cool. But um, so, so I went through Western medicine with a little bit different with all of this stuff going on in the background. And I did all my externships with holistic vets, except for I went out to the Navajo Nation and did their, their veterinary program there because I wanted to get out into the indigenous world. So, um, yeah, so that, that's where I've been. And then when I got out, I knew I wanted to practice acupuncture and Dr. Shea from the Chi University had just shown up in the United States from China and had just opened his classes. So I was in his second ever acupuncture class that he taught because I had, I could choose between that or going to Ivis and Ivis was more based on a Western European view of acupuncture. 
And I was like, I want the Chinese. <laughs> I want to get it from the horse's mouth. So I started studying with him. And now I teach up there. I just got back from teaching a weekend. So I'm teaching veterinary students, veterinarians, how to find acupuncture points and stuff. So it's been fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredibly impressive. I, I mean, it's especially been- all of the foresight you had. It's just none of it was <laughs> none of it was foresight, and I also, I mean, layered on top of that, I had my own healing journey. I mean, I went through, you know, healing childhood abuse and rough family stuff and narcissistic stuff, all of that. But the thing that my guiding light through all of it, and I just want to put this out there for people, is my passion was my passion, what I really wanted to do. And I had a really good advisor. He was actually this psychic from Santa Fe, Rand Lee. And um, he's still around. He has a lot of health problems right now. But he really helped kept bringing me back in. Like, if you could do anything in the world and, and you're here on earth this one time, what do you want to do? And... And actually that, that long ago, it was actually to improve the relationship between humans and the animal world so that we can go back to a balanced relationship between them and we can learn as much from them as they can from us. And that's the guiding principle uh, about my online, I have an online community called Gateway to Gaia. And that's the guiding principle to that is getting people to stop <laughs> slow down from the stress and really listen, listen to that tree that's outside, go out and hang out with the plants and your dog and see what they have to tell you every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's in, it's a tall order, but it is powerful if you can get there. And I'm not saying I'm there. I've had (laughs) micro moments, you know, (laughs) But all those, those micro moments are what count. Like sometimes we think we have to be the big wow moment and all the bells and whistles are going to go off. And it's those, it's those micro moments is that 10 second, like, Oh, wow. I think I just heard that from it or, you know, just being more in tune and slowing down. Mm -hmm. It's very important. It's important for our health. It's important for the health of the planet. It's important for future generations. Yes. I, I'm, I, I, I feel every word you're saying because like I was saying earlier, you and I have been Facebook friends for a while. And so I see your posts and I am just like, I am drawn in to like every single one. (laughs) It's like, that's like my goal in life is to get somewhere in the vicinity of where you are in connection with plants and animals, because I think that is like the ultimate of human existence. In, in my mind. We already have it. Yeah, we have it in our bones. It's, it's, it's just that we've been pulled so far. It's like taffy. We've been pulled so far away from it. You know, it's like a, I, sometimes I feel like it's going to be a slingshot and then <laughs> all this stuff. It is kind of imploding around us right now. So I do have to say, and there's reasons for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm so impressed with with your journey to where you've gotten to today and i know that the message that you have right now one of your passion projects is so incredibly important i I, i'm gonna let you talk about it but i do want to say like the because of how i have cultivated my online social media i can't open up facebook for example Mm -hmm. a single day and not see this particular problem. Really? With the, I, I, like, medications. With the different, me- you know, Facebook groups and stuff that I'm in, every single day, at least one, I see some sort of post where one of these medications you're going to talk about is like, somebody's like, oh my gosh, how do I, this is what my vet said. How do I, I know this isn't right, or this hasn't been working and they've been on it for three months, six months, whatever, it, you know what I mean? And it breaks my heart. So I want, I'd like for you to to talk about (laughs) what I saw happening on the, uh, you know, I can talk about it kind of on the macro level and then we can bring it down a little bit narrow on the macro level. I have seen 
there's there's been a whole deregulation of medicine and science. We've lost our scientific principles and ethics. I went to school because I was going to be a biologist. I actually was studying genetics back in the late 80s. And I had a choice between studying animals or studying genetics. And I didn't want to be in a lab with pipetting things all day long. So I've been following the whole pandemic and all of this very carefully. Um, we all know the FDA is pretty much bought off. Our government, our government regulate, regulatory bodies with the CDC and the FDA and everything else are no longer, they aren't looking out for the average citizen, period, or the average dog, period. I mean, we know that from the dog food. And what I see happening is that they have seen <laughs> veterinary medicine they've realized the power, you know, big corporations and big money people have realized how much money people are willing to spend on their animals and they've seen it as another marketplace. So what happened about seven years ago as at one of the largest veterinary conferences in the, in the world, actually up in Orlando and normally veterinarians, you've got your large animal guys coming in and they've got the Wranglers and their cowboy boots on and you've got your horse people and you've got your small animal vets. They're not, they might be in business casual. They might be wearing their scrubs. You know, it's, it's veterinarians and everybody's kind of casual and it's like a break from practice and we can chat. Well, I noticed a distinct change in the whole timber of that conference. And I was like, what is going on? There were these groups of people walking around in black suits and this corporate attire. And there were people sitting in the lobbies of these big hotels signing contracts left and right. Well, what was happening is the corporations were coming in and buying up small mom and pop veterinary clinics. And then as the corporations came in, that what they've been doing is essentially modeling the broken human healthcare system onto veterinary medicine. And so then the insurance companies come in because they're like, well, if we get everybody on health insurance, on insurance for their pets, then we can up all our prices. So the corporation owns the clinic, the vets will work for us, we'll skim this much off the top. Then if we own like a hundred clinics, we can go to big, you know, Pfizer or Muriel or Merck, and we make, can make deals with them them on pharmaceuticals. So they can buy a pallet of, say, my favorite drug in the world, gabapentin, for this much money on the dollar, but they can turn around and sell it for this and make this big of a profit. So that's all they are looking at. They're looking at what their cost is and what their profit is and how much they can get to the, because, you know, Mars Nestle is a public, I believe it's a publicly traded company. So they're looking at quarterly earnings and what they can offer their shareholders. Now this has taken over our whole entire society, but because I'm a vet and this is my passion to care for animals, it is taken over veterinary medicine. And this is why we're seeing what we're seeing. Now, the vets, we have the highest suicide rate of any profession right now. And the reason is the vets are being squeezed in between corporate ownership and the clients and they're caring for the animal, but they don't have anywhere to go. I was teaching a group of four young vets up at Chi University this last weekend, and all four of them were like, were, you know, I asked them why they were there. And they said, Josie, why, we're here because we cannot handle corporate medicine anymore. I mean, they were about ready to implode. I have this young girl very first day of class. We had a dog there. We were going to start pointing out points. She went into a meltdown. I had to guide them through a 15 minute meditation just to bring them back in their body. They were so stressed out. And because they're not giving options, they're saying, this is your 15 minutes to be in this exam room with this patient. If you have, they're giving algorithms, if which that's why things are being misdiagnosed. They're not being taught the old SOAP protocol, which we were used to ta be taught in medical school, like subjective objective assessment plan. They're giving algorithms, yes, no, like a computer, which can lead you straight off very quickly, especially when it comes to medical cases. So, and then they get down to what the disease is and they're like, well, this is what's on the shelf. And so this is how you're going to treat it. So when I started seeing cases come to me, I see a lot of cases come to me that are, um, they're the chronic cases. They're the cases that they haven't found any answers for. They're the cancers, they're the autoimmune, they're the, you know, my dog's dying and I want to try this as a last ditch effort. Okay. So I started seeing all these cases coming to me. Everybody's on gabapentin. 
Now, you know, in, in the holistic world, everybody worries about, oh, everybody's put on antibiotics and everybody's put, you put on prednisone. That was 15 years ago. <laughs> now everybody's put on gabapentin. And the thing is the, the, um, and that's not the only one. There's a whole list. The drug reps come in and they tell the vet, oh, there's no side effects to this drug and it's great for pain. Use it on your, use it on the dogs. Now, if anybody, we also have something called an opioid crisis in this country right now. And there's a really great program on Hulu called Dope Sick that describes exactly what I'm talking about. You can overlay what has happened in that movie between the FDA, between the drug companies and between the pharmaceuticals and the small veterinary practice going, Oh, you got, you know, coal miners with the sore back, give them this. That's what's happening in vetment. Now, the problem with these drugs is, is because big pharma is in tune, is a revolving door with the FDA, there are no safety and efficacy studies being done anymore. There weren't on the jab. I just talked, I just listened to a two hour program with a bio, biochemist talking about that. So they're not doing safety and efficacy studies, but they're going out and telling doctors, oh, it's safe and efficacious. <laughs> So actually with gabapentin, I dug around and I wrote an article, you can find it on the internet, but I dug around in primary research articles. There was a lab out in Stanford and they were showing that they found out it was um, inhibiting an enzyme that is needed in order to repair nerve connections in the brain. So we don't know what for sure it does. We know it's addictive. There's five states where it's on the edge of becoming a controlled substance. People are abusing it on the street. And there was the latest information that came out on the human side. There was a group of doctors that did a study about how well it was as a pain reliever. And they looked at people in hospital getting neurological operations, back surgeries and all kinds of things like that when it was prescribed to them. And their findings at the end of that article were literally like, this is no more efficacious than like an aspirin and it's actually probably worse in terms of relieving pain that and it's it's so obvious by what we saw from our records we don't recommend people even spending another dime on doing another study regarding pain relief in a gabapentin okay now what it's doing to animals is concerning because it sedates them and it makes cats like not care that they're in a veterinary clinic but what is that doing long term to their brains? We don't know. It is a big question mark. Another drug that's being handed out like candy out of a Pez dispenser is trazodone. Trazodone is a short term SSRI inhibitor like the same class of drugs as Prozac, but it works very short term and short acting. So it's in the system and out of the system. But now I mean, I had a horrible case of a dog, a dog come from a rescue and the rescue group handed the, handed the adopt the foster mother, a Ziploc bag filled with trazodone and said, give two of these every night. Her, her son and what happened to be a um, neuropharmacologist. And he's like, if I gave two tablets, that dose of trazodone to a person, especially like an adolescent or something, they would probably be having hallucinations and having very untoward side effects. So it, what's also happening is that we have all these antidepressant, antidepressants being used as anti-anxieties, Prozac, trazodone, um, you know, there's a whole gamut of them. And then we have the whole class of drugs of the opioids high powered opioids. And I do not understand this. I practiced m veterinary medicine for like 26 years or so. I was in, it was in shelters. I was doing 30 surgeries a day. There was not a single surgery, even I'm, I'm going to fair game it to say even orthopedic back surgeries and, and pelvic fractures and things that required a high powered opiate like methadone or Dilaudid now they've got a gel, opioid gel for cats that they're promoting for declaws. And you, you have to have specially trained staff because the staff, if they get it on their hands, there's a potential for overdose and respiratory arrest. 
Um, you're not supposed to touch the cat for a half hour after applying it. And yet you're supposed to put this on the cat and send it home with the, with the, and once it's on, you can't take it off and opioids, the way opioids work, there's a very fine line between too much and too little. And if you get too much, they shut off the brainstem, the respiratory, the respiratory system in the brainstem right away. And so you stop breathing. And unless you get Narcan on board and enough or Narcan repeatedly on board, that person or animal will just stop breathing. So it's really dangerous. I've had two dogs, two little 16 year old geriatrics, one 16, one 17, given methadone for pain relief in an ER and they both ended up um, dying. So, I, and when I found out about that, I'm like, this is absolutely insane because our dogs, these are doctors who know pharmacology are licensed to give drugs, prescribing these drugs, but they're not really looking into what they're prescribing. And we don't know, you know, the SSRI inhibitors like the trazodone, we're, we're finding there's some really good programs out now. One of them is called Medicating Normal. There was also a, it was a podcast I put up with these two girls. They were, they were on SSRIs for, from the time they were teenagers up to their mid twenties. And they were, they were switched onto so many drugs. At one point, this one girl was taking six different drugs and she was like, I've got to get off of them. So these, the problem is, is people are having an incredibly hard time getting off these drugs because they're um, because of the side effects. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the side effects in animals because they can't tell us about their internal state. And I have seen dogs in such a weird drugged out state, um, but talking to people, they're getting hallucinations. They're having, they're, they're having, ideation of like killing people they're watching people's faces melt into monsters in front of them so now you take an already aggressive dog or a dog in a shelter and you put them on a drug like that and where they're seeing the biggest problems with side effects is putting them on the drug taking them off putting them on taking them off and that's like that short acting thing you know mm -hmm. it, so it's, it's very concerning to me. It's very concerning to me. And at this point, it's like, I don't even want to, I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of my newer cases. I'm having to be a drug rehab withdrawal person just to get the animal, just so I can see what normal is underneath all the junk that they're on, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's horrible. Scary. Yeah. yeah. And you walk, I walk into somebody's house for the very first time and you know, the dog, even if the dog is old and can't get up well or anything else, they're still going to be barking. They're going to be like, who's coming into my territory? You know, they're a dog. Mm -hmm. They'll be laying there like staring at a blank wall. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, their eyes are open. If I wave my hand in front of their face, they're aware, but they're just like in a different place. Yeah. And I don't think that's quality of life. And mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, long term taking them off these meds, that's a whole nother issue too. I mean, I just had one woman try to save this dog who had aggression issues and we got the dog off the meds. And then two weeks after his aggression just started spiraling out of control and, and we put him to sleep. I mean, you can't have a dog that's, you know, she's, he was harming her. He was literally drawing blood from her. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. It It is very scary. And I know I see <clears throat> one of the things I see more often than not is on social media uh, are, are cat moms generally mm -hmm. who are posting about their cat being on gabapentin and they don't seem to think it's working, but they don't know what else to do. Just take them off of it. We've never <laughs> done it. Listen, I, here's, here's the message I want to get to people. I practiced for 25 years and I didn't have gabapentin. I didn't have trazodone. I didn't use morphine. I didn't use methadone. I didn't use fentanyl. I didn't use all these high powered opioids that can kill your animal. Okay. And the animals did just fine. All right. My patients, my long-term patients, most of my practice at this point is made up of long-term patients and clients. So I'm on their third or fourth animal. And at this point I've got them, got them trained for good diets, raw food. I mean, I saw a 15 year old Bishla who's on raw fermented food is on um, Chinese herbs and on some supplements on bone broth, on goat's milk and no drugs. 
and goes out for walks four times a day, just got its blood work done and his blood looks like a two-year-old dog. There's no gabapentin involved. So, and and what's happening, I think, is the vets will come in, they they (coughs) hear the complaints and the owner going, wah, 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 wah. Oh, here, try this and leave my office because the 15 minutes is up. I mean, I hate to say that, but I think everybody's so stressed out. They don't want to dive into the case and look for alternative scenarios. I don't understand why Pat would be on gabapentin. I really don't. Yeah, it's... it. It it is interesting because as you were saying, the co- corporations, uh, Mars being one of them, have really gone in and just bought yeah. up so many veterinary practices, and they have changed the standard of care. Yes, for every other veterinarian in the country, willing yes. or unwilling, right? <laughs> yes, yes. It's, so it's this very much templated medicine where they are treating a disease versus treating the patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's where they're at. And it's and it, half it is half not even diagnosing the disease correctly. I mean, I hate to say this, you, you know, you can have fancy MRIs and all of this stuff, but you, you still not won't necessarily treat, you know, diagnose the disease correctly. So, yeah. And the side effects are really scary. And like you were saying, we don't, we don't really know, know what they are we for don't. our animals. Yeah. yeah. Cuz I know I was on um in my in my younger days in my 20s I was very much that person that was like give me a pill for whatever mm-hmm. I, you know is going on. And I had really bad migraines and they gave me what essentially was an antidepressant that they were using to treat migraines. So, mm-hmm. so you know like an off label type type or, or uh, yeah, it's I don't know what it's called. the label yeah usage yeah yeah and I I tell my husband all the time he gets so frustrated with me my memory is shot wow like I literally I have like chunks of time I couldn't tell you what happened mm. and I it, attributed it all do we do. yeah I attributed it to being on that medication for, I was on that medication for like four or five years mm-hmm. before I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not taking any more <laughs> pills. <laughs> and yeah, just knowing, and like you were saying, these other women with this podcast, like ha- how many other people are having it's, all of these different. It's rampant. It's rampant. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a new documentary on Netflix about take your pills, Xanax, just Xanax. Like the benzodiazepines, they were never meant for long-term use. And it, it it's out of control. And then people get on them long-term and you cannot get off. Like your body just flips out. And, you know, I know people that are taking razor blades and just gradually shaving off a little bit, a little bit less every day. But I mean, that's what kind of way to live like that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I put it back on, I put it back on the pharmaceutical companies and I put it back on the doctors. The doctors are being lazy. If they, if they want a medical license and they, they know pharmacology, you don't, I never go by drug rep words. I get out and plus we've got Google. There is no living excuse right now. You can look up drug monographs. You can go into PubMed. You can look at the studies that are done on these medications. It's, there's no excuse in my mind, honestly. Um, and, and if you don't like what the gabapentin is doing, say, I'm not going to give it and Let's dig deeper and see what's going on. You know, mm-hmm. that's what I would say. Another one of these drugs that, you know, a lot of dogs get on and then they can't ever seem to get off of them because, again, the root cause isn't being addressed is Apoquel. Oh, Apoquel. Apoquel is, is terrifying, actually. Um, I've seen some super, super aggressive cancers with dogs that were on daily Apoquil. And again, here's a drug that when it came out, it was labeled for five days of use, five days. And then of course, oh, they're doing so good and they're not itching. Let's just extend that out for months and years. And, you know, I watched, I watched a Doberman meltdown in two weeks with cancer that went through wildfire through this dog's body. And then I was at a, at a veterinary conference because I'm like, what is going on with the Apoquil? 
And I would rather, honestly, and, and most holistic vets will probably just cringe when I say this, I would rather have a dog come to me on prednisone than Apoquil. I would rather give a dog Tamarol P for their allergies than Apoquil because at least I know what it does is a yin deficiency. I can work my way backward and I can at least get them off the drug and I can get them rebalanced afterwards. With Apoquil, because it's targeted to a very specific part of the nerve, the immune system, it's, it, I think it does more damage than we realize. Um, but I, I stood, I, I sat in a veterinary conference. There was probably a good 500 people in this room watching two board certified dermatologists banter back and forth about Apoquil. And they threw a slide up with 10 different forms of cancer. And they said, well, if your dog, you know, if a patient comes in and they end up being diagnosed with one of these forms of cancer and they're on Apoquil, just take, we recommend taking them off the Apoquil. And I, <laughs> slammed my notebook shut and stood up and I said, and raised my hand and spoke at the same time. I said, isn't that a little bit too late in the game? And then I got up and I walked out the door. I mean, that's all I needed to hear from them. Yeah. Once you have, you know, and I tell people, once you have cancer, there's no, there's no curing cancer. There's no getting rid of cancer. Once you have cancer, there's a greater increased chance you're going to develop another form of cancer. And you're always going to worry about that cancer coming out of remission and coming back if you can get it into remission. Mm -hmm. So the time to treat cancer is before you have cancer, people and humans, honestly. You know, people, well, well, why, why does my dog have cancer? Well, let me go all the way back to puppyhood, <laughs> you know, and we'll look at all of your vaccines. We'll look at the food that was fed. We'll look at what, you know, do you, you have the yard company come and spray your yard with Roundup and pesticides and you have, you know, the termite company come and it just goes on and on and on. And so mm -hmm. the time to treat cancer is before you have cancer. And even then, there's a lot of dogs that still get cancer, but you can at least say you tried your best at what you had at your disposal, you know? Yeah. So knowing all of this, knowing that, you know, it's, it's really the pharmaceutical companies have just taken hold of veterinary medicine yeah. um, very much like they have for human medicine. What recommendations do you have for pet parents going into their veterinarian's office? Um, I mean, number one, if they, if they want to reach for one of those drugs, I would just, I would try to develop a relationship with your veterinarian and, you know, try to, it, it, try to get the door open a little bit and say, listen, I'm, I know you, you know, you prescribe that drug a lot, but I'd really prefer another alternative. And is there any other alternative way we can go with this? Mm -hmm. You know, that, and just ask, just to open up the door and even maybe to go to the point of say, I'm not looking for a quick fix. I really want to try to get to the root of what's best for my animal. And do you have any other alternatives? Now there's a ton of veterinarians getting certified in acupuncture. They may not have like the food thing behind them or anything, but they're at least the door is open in their mind. So there's a different way of healing going on out there. Um, so it's worth that. And if all they have to do is to write you that prescription for one of these drugs, then I would say I look for another veterinarian and another clinic. Um, I would approach them with, you know, nutrition if you can. Sometimes some of my clients, I tell if, the, if it's a good veterinarian that I know, a lot of the veterinarians know how I work. So if they say, somebody says they're one of my clients, they already know, oh, they're going to be on all this weird stuff. You know, they're kind of like, <laughs> she's the witch doctor in Miami. But anyways, they, um, but they respect me at the same time. So they know not to push the bag of Hills or the bag of Royal Canaan or whatever they're selling out in the front of their clinic. Um, the other, the biggest thing that I would watch out for in emergency rooms, and this may be a localized area, but we are having a major problem with the opioid abuse in emergency rooms. And what I would tell them, if you have to actually leave your animal at an emergency room, I would tell them they are extremely sensitized to opioids and I would prefer another method of pain control. 
to put that in their ear so that they're not reaching for these things that can kill your animal, you know? Yeah. I think emergency medicine is what somebody like me that scares me more than anything because I know every time I have had to go to an emergency vet Mm -hmm. generally in the middle of the night, it's, always uh they rush out and grab your pet and take them back and you're stuck in the waiting room for hours and it's like what is happening to my pet in this yeah what i would say you know because they usually will ask if they have any allergies to medications or anything if they don't you need to you need to yell at their as they're running in the back going they have they are they have a sensitivity to opioids and anesthetics just put it that way so that maybe if they do reach for those drugs, they'll use lower doses mm-hmm. or you can say they had a reaction. They had a really bad reaction to opioids. And so it might make them think twice to reach for something else or reach for a less potent one, you know, because, that's a good tip. yeah, because you are at their mercy. And I, I mean, that's the scariest thing with me. I, I literally called up, I used to do relief work as I was building up my house call practice years ago. And one of these cases that overdosed was at a hospital that I'd work with. And I knew the owner of the clinic and I called her up. It took me three weeks to get this woman on the phone, but I finally got her on the phone. She still didn't want to discuss the case with me. And I said, I said, you know, Dr. Such and such, I need to, you need to know what's going on in your emergency room with this. And you need to look into this because it's a serious problem. And it, the thing is, it's not only a serious problem for the animals dying. If they don't know how to handle these drugs and they inadvertently get a needle poke, you could have a technician drop dead on the floor. You know, I'm just waiting for that to happen. But yeah, so it's, it's serious. It's not something to be messed around with. Yeah, and I know from you know, talking and and having similar conversations with other veterinarians, um, if it's not an emergency, one of one of the the kind of recurring themes that I'm hearing is if you're just going into your your regular veterinarian, if it's not an emergency, to say thank you so much for that information. I'm going to take 24 hours to review everything you've told me. And then I'll get back to you on what we want to do moving forward. Yeah. I think that's very empowering for a pet parent as well. Yeah, because and I found they, they're using these different almost sales tactics. When I when I learned to practice, we would walk into an exam room and and we would, you know, actually I learned this in vet school. You would look at your patient, you do your physical exam, and then you, you go out and you think about it a little bit. What's going to be the testing that you want to run and stuff? And then you go back in. And it now... You know, we'd be like, let's start with the blood work and let's find out what comes out here, here, and then we'll decide if we need to do this test or do x-rays or do ultrasound or something. Nowadays, they're walking in with this list of $3,000 worth of testing and just wanting to run it all right off the bat. And, And you don't have to do that. You know, and they get, and I know I've, I've stood there and watched them get mad when people refuse it. They're like, can we discuss this? You know, it's the cancer clinic, one of the cancer clinics down here. I mean, somebody walked in and it was actually a client of mine. She's an attorney and she's really on the ball. And she's like, the, the oncologist came back in the room and said, well, we want to, you know, amputate. Then it will be seven, this many weeks of radiation and this many weeks of chemotherapy. And the total will come to like $15,000. Would you like to put that on your visa or your American Express? And I mean, he said that in t- in like three minutes time. And she just, she... She just was like, whoa, she let, she laid him low. She didn't even talk about her dog. She's like, you aren't getting number one. You're never going to get my American Express or my visa at this point in time. Cause I'm not going to leave my dog here under your care. And if this is how you're even going to discuss this with me, I'm going somewhere else. You know, I mean, it was just, it's, a, it's obscene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there certainly, I think many of us have, have had situations where we have just been rubbed the wrong way. <laughs> and, and it's, 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 I, I, it hurts me because it's not the profession that I went into, you know, it's just not. 
And yeah. now we're, I think there's, ba- there's backpedaling happening because though, because you were talking about that standard of care. Now they're talking about the, um, oh, they've got a name for it. It just came out in one of my journals where they're like the, like the sphere of care. So they realize that not everybody has $20,000 to plop down. And so now they're having to backpedal and say, well, you know, what, what can we do for this animal? Even though what's going to be the best for the animal and the family and, you know, like do a trial of antibiotics, you know, and see how they respond to, or different things like that, or give them a chance to heal before you just jump, you know? Yeah. That's good news. I guess, you know? Yeah. Because otherwise it's what, what's happening is people aren't being able to afford it and they're dumb. They're the shelters are filling up right now. And the shelters and nonprofits are pushing this because they're like, hey, guys, this is insane. You know, you got to start giving people options to care. Mm -hmm. I just did. I just treated a case. She was in the neurologist. They wanted twelve thousand dollars. They they said and they were and and the neurologist down here is like, well, we're going to put him through the MRI. So you so we'll just automatically take him to surgery after the MRI. There's no waking him up in between and talking about what they're going to do. So they want the full twelve thousand dollars down. And this poor woman didn't have the money. And one of my clients was happened to me in the in the waiting room, and she's like, call her. And we got the dog. The dog was not totally paralyzed, but we got the dog back up and walking now. You know, after like two months of acupuncture and herbs and other stuff going on but um there are different options Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's one of the biggest things for people to to understand is that there are different options because most most people i have talked to it's like well this is what my vet says and that has like that's period end of statement there's nothing else right there's a lot of different vets out there and, and yeah. you, need to, you know, it, it's become like human medicine. Don't take the first opinion, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, you know, talk to friends, talk to neighbors, see what's going on, you know? Yeah. So if somebody listening has been triggered because they heard uh, maybe the name of a medication that their pet is on right now. Mm-hmm. What kind of recommendations do you have for them? Because obviously their current veterinarian prescribed those medications. Do you think they should find a, a second opinion? I would find a second opinion. And I would look at what they're treating and why they're treating it that way and what other options for treatment there are. Seriously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, you know, what happened, part of what happened with the gabapentin, and it was because... <laughs> This is this is how evil this gets, and this is what people need to understand. Though the same year that gabapentin got started coming out and being pushed on the veterinary market was the same year that Pfizer was involved in a forty-six billion dollar lawsuit settlement for that drug because it was causing rage syndrome in people. Okay, which is really interesting to think about because now we've got all these aggression issues in dogs. Were they given gabapentin when they were neutered and spayed? You know, like what would, you know, so rage syndrome in people. So they knew they were going to lose that market to a certain extent, but they really haven't. It's still being so, but when a, when a pharmaceutical company has a lawsuit against them, there's a really good book on this called the sickening of America. And it's by a, I think he's an MD and he was a, a, witness for some of these lawsuits. So he would go over the paperwork and the data, but here's what they do. They don't want the lawsuit to become public because if it is public, then they have to release all that data and all those side effects and all those problems with the drugs and all the people that died from it or whatever. So what they do is they, they settle out of court. And as part of their settlement, all that data gets hidden. Locked away locked away in a vault. And that's what happened with gabapentin. So then I was like, well, who first started recommending it and why were they recommending it? It was a op-ed piece in a veterinary journal. It was not a study. It was not a scientific study saying this for this pain and this and this and this. It was an op-ed piece by a woman who worked for Pfizer, a veterinarian who worked for Pfizer. 
And then they started hitting, they started going out and selling it just like the people from Oxycontin started selling Oxycontin. That, that's what I was getting ready to say. That's so interesting because I, I think I remember in Dope Sick, that's how it started too, was with an op-ed piece. Yes. It's, it's their, it is their, it's their playbook. It is their playbook for selling these drugs. And it goes uh-huh. as simple as that, but it's really scary now. And, and also in, in human medicine, they just, one of the studies on gabapentin they came out with was saying that when it is prescribed with an opioid for surgical pain, managing post-operative surgical pain in humans, they found a 70%, 70% increase in respiratory difficulties coming out of surgery, some to the point where the people had to go on ventilators. Now, I know a bull terrier that was on, he was on the chicken feather diet. He was on gabapentin, on Apoquil, and on, um, had to go in for surgery, was given gabapentin and Dilaudid, hydromorphone. And when the dog recovered, they had an oxygen concentrator at their house. And this, it was a gay couple. And this guy would sleep with his arms around that dog because in the nighttime, the dog would stop breathing. And he wanted to feel the dog stop breathing. So he'd rouse the dog back awake and get it on the oxygen concentrator. That went on for three months until I came on the case. Gosh. I mean, these are like, this is, this is why these are the horror stories I'm seeing that is not normal. So if, if they're finding these results in human medicine using gabapentin combined with opioids, which they are doing in veterinary medicine, it needs to stop. You know, I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's like malpractice. <laughs> that date is there. It needs to stop. You know, I can see a lot about a lot of other things in human medicine right now, especially immunology and, but we won't go there, but it's the same thing. It needs to stop. And, but people, and people need to empower themselves. I, I told this to these young veterinarians I was teaching. You don't need to follow along just because the vet writes you a prescription with a pill on it to take home to give to your dog does not mean you have to give to your dog. Go to another vet, look stuff up, Google it, find out what's going on with it. You know, mm-hmm. take your power back, learn about your body. Um, there's so many, there's functional medicine doctors out there. There's so much information online. There's no excuse for people not to be able to look stuff up and learn stuff even about their animal i mean there's a ton of us holistic vets on there there's all these programs on there about feeding and i you can find so much so um you know take your power back and realize you don't have to do exactly what the doctor says you have to do you know yeah i know i mean the doctors are always telling us to lose weight and we don't do that right (laughs) Or they're putting, you know, they they artificially lower the normal cholesterol values on blood work to get everybody on statins. That's another good example, you know? Oh, yeah. I went down the statin rabbit hole about a year ago because my husband's been on it for, well, he's 63. And like in his 40s, I started him on statins. And I, I actually got him off of it for a little while. And he was doing really, really well. And um, he had a doctor recently convince him to go back on it. And I was like, but you didn't get the, you didn't get the right cholesterol testing done. And, yeah. you know, like, it, yeah, yeah. So. And they, did. they artificially, lo- they lowered the normal values from what they used to be. It, yeah. It's insane what is happening. Yeah. You know, but yeah. here, here it goes back to, though, taking the consumer and the person taking their power back from these people. Uh, you you know your body better than anybody else. You know your dog and you know your cat better than anybody else. If you give them that pill and that cat turns into a zombie laying there on your bed, then there is something wrong. Stop giving them the pill. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now you can, you can safely stop gabapentin and you can safely stop trazodone without things happening. It's not going to kill the dog. The one drugs you can't safely stop are benzodiazepines like Xanax and I think Clonopin and um, Zalium. Those you I, have to be with a doctor, but everything else, just stop giving it and, and, and give them time to come out of it. You know, it can take those SSRIs, these girls on the podcast, they were on these SSRIs, Prozac and something like Trazodone for 10 years. It took them two and a half years for their neurological system to balance back out and even out 
for them to not stop hallucinating or having suicidal ideation or I, I mean, we're talking serious, serious problems. Uh, that yeah. is, yeah, that is very serious. And it, it just, of course, always makes me wonder what are the animals going through? Yeah, yeah. And they can't tell us. And I've seen dogs and cats that look almost like they're hallucinating sometimes from it, you know? <sighs> But that makes yeah. it even more, if we don't know and we don't know what it does, then that makes it even more of like, take 10 steps back and don't, tr there's other options. I practiced for 25 years without these medications. They don't need to be given. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. And you know, I had um, a cat a number of years, well, I still have him, but a number of years ago, um, my, my vet gave him what's, I think it was fluoxetine, the like kitty Prozac. That's perfect. Yeah. And after three days, he was acting like a zombie. And I called my vet and I said, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing this. And yeah. she, like, she kind of was like, well, why, why not? I'm like, he's, he's acting like, a, like, this is no quality of life. And she literally was like, didn't understand how I could prioritize his quality of life. You know what I mean? Like it was like, the conversation was like, that just boggles my mind. Boggles it, my mind. it does. It does. But, um, yeah, I, I so appreciate that. Take take your power back. <laughs> yeah, take your power back. You know, and, and get as many different opinions as you as you can out there. You know, I I I received after I wrote that article on gabapentin, I received a couple emails every single month saying, "Can I just stop giving my dog that pill?" <laughs> they people want permission. It's like just they yeah. do. You know, they do. And, and one of the things too, with like pain relief, I've seen there, when they put gabapentin on the market, they gave NSAIDs a really bad name. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So aspirin, Tylenol, carprofen, Rimadol, Medicam. I've had dogs, honestly, being a holistic vet, I will, they'll, they'll probably scream at this too. I've had, I put dogs on Rimadol and Medicam and it's given them five more years of happy life of being able to go for walks in the neighborhood with their human. They didn't go into kidney failure. They didn't go into renal failure from it. And they were pain free. Okay. So you that can, is the most important part. Yeah. If it's like, okay, we're going to give them all these drugs and they're going to be miserable and be a zombie, or you're going to have a dog that's pain free. The inflammation is out of their body and they can, they can, chase after the tennis ball with you you know i mean isn't that that's what's important so but part of their part of their marketing scheme was to badmouth the insides so that they could get everybody back on on something else you know like a couple of vets i've younger vets i've talked to they're like you use rimadil and i'm like you know how many thousands of dogs have been on it and they haven't died they haven't had the side effects from all this other crap you're trying to give them you know yeah. So, I mean, side you know, when I remember um, when I was in college, I was, I studied psychology, but I remember in one of my classes very, very well, my instructor said side effects are effects of the drug they don't want you to think about. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so, They're just on the side, there's, there's sidelines. Yes. Ignore that. <laughs> And that has stuck with me ever since that every time I see side effects that pops in my head. And I said, these are, these are effects of the drugs that the pharmaceutical company doesn't want you to think about. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I've taken, you know, the side effects of drugs so much more seriously than I ever did before. Um, it, it's funny, the things that, you know, stick in your brain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. and that, I think that's why like a well-rounded, having like a well-rounded education though is important, you know, which I don't think people are necessarily getting these days either, you know, really don't. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I know. <laughs> um, well, okay. Dr. Josie, th I mean, I don't want to, we're already approaching an hour and I want to be respectful of your time, but this, 
is such a serious topic and such an important topic that I'm really honored that you're allowing me to to use your voice to get it out to to more people. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I'm I'm so happy to be on to be asked to be on to get it out to people. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I think that's how we change things. And and we are we we are the caretakers of these animals. We're their voice, and we're making choices for their health. And so you, that's why I say about taking your power back on that. Don't just go along yeah. with, you know, if, if you're not feeling comfortable. Yeah. And I think, I know I talk about this a lot to get to the point where you want to take your power back. You have to accept personal responsibility first. Oh yeah. And understand oh, yeah. that, yes, you are making, whether you think you are or not, you can say that the vet is making the decisions, but you're the one putting those pills in your dog's mouth every night and that's what yeah i mean i've i've had very close loved ones die of opioid doses in my life and when i see a dog dying of an opioid overdose i'm like a human being gave that dog that drug that dog didn't go and open a pill bottle and was addicted saying i need more of this a human being gave that dog that pill, whether it's the person, the animal the dog's owner or the vet who prescribed it, or, you know, it goes all the way down the chain, but the responsibility factor is huge. And I think that's something I, I really, I'm a practicing Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist, and that there it's all about responsibility of how we perceive the world and our choices we make on a minute to minute basis. And I forget that a lot of times because it's a, it's really easy to sit somewhere and point the finger and say, they made me do it, but nobody's making you do anything. Yeah. Mm. And, and it can be hard. I know I just it's personally. Hard. Yeah, personally, I can say I have had multiple instances with multiple animals that I still am trying to reconcile the decisions that I made, but I own that I made those decisions and, and the grief associated with that. And that propels me forward to continue doing better for the, well, the animals that are in my care today. And we're, here's the thing. None of us are perfect. And as a veterinarian, I'm not perfect. And I, I mean, I look back at my animal sheltering days. I worked at a knife and gun club clinic out in New Mexico. I mean, it was hardcore. And every animal that you may, knowing what you know now, you look back and say, I made a different choice at that time. But that animal came into your life to teach you that, you know? So every single animal that has crossed through my hands has taught me something. So the way we can honor them is to go forward making different choices. That's yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. So I think we'll end on that. But Dr. Josie, how can people find you and follow you? And I know you were talking about your online program, which yeah, um, yeah. is I very interesting. A, I have a, um, you can follow me on Facebook, Dr. Josie Pet Vet. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, you can email me there. I'm probably going to be opening up to some more online f consults. I do some online consults like Second Opinions and Educating for <laughs> you know, herbals and, and nutrition, um, or adding that in what, well, you know, to your already diagnosed pet. And, um, I also have an online community and I have par part of that online community is bringing the spiritual back in, like being able to come to a place in ourselves where we can accept our, our res responsibility and we can take our power back and we can look at our animal as a partnership and be more in partnership with nature. And so that is following the, the five elements of traditional Chinese veterinary medicine through the year and doing meditation. I've got some really interesting people in there with me, uh, animal communicator. And so for, we're doing like the 13 days of Yuletide over Christmas and actually channeling different animal guides coming in. So that's like the woo woo side, which is, that's what keeps me going. So I can get on here and rail on the other, <laughs> on the big pharma side. But then I'm also um, putting together a class on TCVM and the five elements for pet parents to understand. Um, I mean, TCVM is like my heart passion. 
and it's what I base all of my healing off of. And so I want people to be able to understand that when they go into their acupuncturist and be able to, and be able to do some treatment on their animal and start looking at the world from that, through that lens. So, yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I've only re recently found TCVM and it is, it, it's drawing me in for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's a journey. It's a lifetime journey. That's the really cool thing about it is you never stop learning with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. I will make sure to put links to everything um, in the show notes okay. so people can easily grab them and uh, make sure to follow Dr. Josie on all of the socials. And uh, yeah, if you hopefully if you need a consult with her, hopefully you can grab a spot. <laughs> Because I know it's hard. You only have so much time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm trying to do more education just to get the word out because it's so frustrating. There's nothing more frustrating when I get these cases coming to me and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, so. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing what you do too. So. Thank oh, thank you. I appreciate you. And uh, guys, again, make sure to follow Dr. Josie. And until next week, make sure to give your pets some extra love from both me and Dr. Josie this week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.